Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 75 of the Stanford MLSA seminar series. Um, today, uh, I'm joined by Percy and Tatsu on the call, as well as our guest, uh, Nicholas Carlini from Google. Um, we're very excited about today's talk. So uh, Nick or uh, Nick or Nicholas, um, he, he's going to be uh, he, he's going to be talking about some very uh, late breaking work, um, something that uh, about poisoning web scale training data sets and how to do it in a practical way. Um, we're, we're, we're very excited because, you know, this, this paper went on archive just a few days ago and uh, we've been seeing it blow up. So we're very excited to hear from him directly um, about kind of the motivations and, and kind of every, everything there. Um, uh, of course, we're, we're joined by everybody in CS324, the class again, um, and, and everyone on YouTube, and we'll be hearing his talk and then taking questions at the end. So if, you, if you're in the class, you have questions, feel free to post them in Discord and, uh, and we'll get them to Nick. Uh, if you're on the YouTube, feel free to post questions in the chat as well, and, and we'll get them to Nick. Uh, and with that, please take it away. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, okay, let me share the screen and present there we go okay just to check um live very good okay yeah yeah thanks for having me um yeah excited to talk about this paper that we we just put online uh yeah monday or something um so the the basic setup for this talk is we want to be able to look at poisoning attacks and try and understand to what extent these are attacks that you can actually implement in practice or are they just something that you know academics like to play around with in their spare time um, okay, this is um, a talk mostly based on this recent paper, but it has some other results that we've been working on. Um, and I've wrote this with a bunch of co-authors, um, Matthew, Chris, Daniel, Will, Hiram, Andreas, Kurt, and Florian. And uh, it would sort of was great that we had all their help on this. Um, so maybe controversial take. Um, despite the fact that there are 6,000 papers on adversarial machine learning, there are basically no real attacks. Um, you know, what do I mean by this? Um, Let's sort of compare for analogy what happens in computer security. Um, there are papers like, you know, the paper that introduced return oriented programming that have like maybe one to 2,000 citations that like literally change the way we design chips. Like Intel introduced new hardware instructions to prevent the attacks that researchers developed 10 years ago. And these papers have like 1,000 or 2,000 citations. And like there are attacks in machine learning research that have 5,000, 6,000 citations that have had essentially no impact on any practical attack ever. Like maybe there's been like, you know, a couple examples, but like, I don't know of anyone who's like actually ever been harmed by most of these attacks in practice. And um, so it's sort of <laughs> the question here is like, you know, what's going on? Like, why is it the case that like we have lots and lots of people doing research on this topic and we've learned a lot about it. Like the, the science isn't bad. Like we've, these papers are all very good, but like in practice, the actual effect of this research on like what, what malicious people actually do has been essentially nothing. Um, and I think a big part of this comes down to the fact that machine learning research often focuses on the potential impact of an attack and not whether the attack is actually possible in the first place. Uh, so people will show, if only I had white box gradient access to a machine learning model and could feed it arbitrary inputs, then you could do all these bad things, but they don't focus so much on why it is that you should ever be able to have this access in the first place. And so we wanted to try and understand less on the like machine learning side, what's going on, and more on the like, what makes an attack possible? Okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to get started with um, poisoning. Um, Poisoning is an attack that's been around for, for quite some time. Uh, there's a very nice paper that um, appeared at uh, ICML 10 years ago now that showed poisoning attacks on support vector machines, where you, know, you can introduce a malicious example into the training data set in order to make the model perform very, very poorly on the data distribution. So you, know, you add just a few malicious examples of these modified sevens, and all of a sudden the, the MDIS classifier in this case just can't do anything and it fails completely. And you know, this paper got the test of time award at ICML uh, last year. Like the, the research again has been very impactful, but like there are not so many real people who actually poison machine learning training data sets. And like, I think a big reason why is that people me included for a long time have said like, yeah, I mean, it's great that you can actually, you could do this, but like, 
what reason would you ever have to be able to actually have control over the data set? You know, like MNIST was collected in the 90s. Unless you have access to a literal time machine, you cannot go back in time and change the data set. Like they, when they made the data set, it was good. It's a good data set. You can train on it. They didn't poison at the time. We're safe. Like, why should we ever consider poisoning attacks on these data sets that were constructed by benign researchers in a way that was good? And, you know, I sort of had this opinion for some time. I didn't touch poisoning for a long time because I, I didn't believe that these attacks were actually something people could implement. And what I'd like to do now is maybe introduce you to a practical poisoning attack that we think actually works, um, that you someone could do today uh, to cause harm to some, some machine learning algorithms. OK, so um, before I get to that, let's just talk for a minute about data sets um, and what data sets people use to train machine learning models. So suppose that you wanted to train a new state-of-the-art machine learning model. Um, you know, what data set would you use? Well, you know, if it was the 90s, early 2000s, maybe you use MNIST. You know, 50,000 images, handwritten digits, 28 by 28. But like, no one today would train a state-of-the-art machine learning model on MNIST. That's not what you would do. A little bit later, you know, late 2000s, maybe you use CIFAR 10, 50,000 images, 32 by 32. Now they're color, they're a little harder, but still very low resolution. There's only 10 classes. No one today trains state-of-the-art machine learning models on CIFAR 10. Late 2000s, early 2010s, maybe mid 2010s, if you wanted to, a state of the art model, you trade on ImageNet. You know, it's a million ones, so lots and lots of images, a thousand classes, high resolution, but it's only a million images, it's only a thousand classes. Today, most state of the art machine learning research is not done on ImageNet. Like, if you look at like the breakthrough technologies over the last couple of years, they almost all rely on data sets like Lion 5 billion. Um, this is a data set, as the name might suggest, with 5 billion images that was scraped from essentially the entire internet and is just much bigger and much more broad than anything that came before it. And so if you've seen results like OpenAI's clip that you know really fundamentally changed the way that we consider image classifiers or you know stable diffusion or all of these models, like the best current clip models are trained on Lion 5 billion. Stable diffusion is trained on a subset of Lion 5 billion. Like all of these amazing results that we've seen over the last couple of years are, really do come down to the fact that we have these big giant data sets that we can now take advantage of. Okay, so that's great. Um, if you're gonna train a model today, you're gonna use something like this. Um, but that brings up a question. Um, how do you distribute a data set with 5 billion images, right? Like. This is, is not easy. Um, and so the answer is you don't. Like you, you don't actually distribute 5 billion images. Uh, and there are a bunch of reasons why. You know, first of all, it's a couple hundred terabytes. I mean, storage is expensive. It's, bandwidth is expensive. You can't just like send someone a couple hundred terabytes of data like every time someone else wants to train a new model. Um, but also there are a bunch of privacy and copyright and legal reasons that you wouldn't want to do this. Like, I, I don't know what's in these 5 billion images. I don't want to be legally responsible for hosting some illegal content. Um, I might not know if it's copyright and I may not be legally allowed to distribute it. And, you know, people's personal data might be stored there and be, you don't want to sort of be responsible for, for handling this out. So basically people don't distribute these data sets by themselves. Instead, what they do is they distribute a much simpler data structure. You just have the list of URLs that you should go download and the corresponding captions. And then they just tell people, go download this yourself. You know, they'll produce like a downloader that some kind of tool that will automatically scrape these images. And they'll say, you know, here is uh, the metadata of what you should go and do. And you feed this into the downloader and you get your own copy. And this absolves the data set creators of all of these potential problems and sort of pushes them all onto the people who actually use the, the models. And to be clear, like all these problems don't just go away because it's, um, you know, like there still are privacy problems. There still are, you know, all these other problems. It's just no longer sort of the responsibility of the curator to, to, to deal with this. Um, but at least now the data set can exist. Okay, um, so this is the setup for the world. Uh, this is the world we live in. Lion 5 billion exists like this. It's essentially a big giant CSV with 5 billion rows uh, with URLs and with captions. Okay, so um, now here's where the attack comes in. Uh, this data set was probably not malicious 
when it was collected. Like I know the people who built Lion 5 billion, they seem like entirely reasonable people. I mostly trust them to not have poisoned the data set. Um, but who's to say the data set is not still malicious today? In particular, the main observation we make for our attack is that domain names expire. And when domain names expire, anyone can buy them. In particular, I can buy them. So anyway, um, I now own 0.01% of Lion. Um, and uh, I have bought the domain names corresponding to this. Uh, and so anyone, if you've used Lion in uh, you know, the last six months, uh, you've come to me and asked me for images. And because I'm a nice person, I didn't poison your data set. But like, you have to rely on that uh, sort of fact. And, and not just Lion. Um, you know, I own 0.01% of Lion 5 billion, Lion 400 million, Coyo 700 million, Conceptual 12 million, Conceptual Captions 3 million, PubFig, FaceScrub, and VGG Face. So if you have used any of these data sets any time in the last six months, like you have come to a web server that like I am hosting that like, you know, I could have sort of just returned malicious data. Um, you know, you, 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 have, you have trusted me to not poison your data set. Like my, my web server like literally has like a does Nichols feel evil today Boolean that like is currently set to false. But like if I ever set it to true, it would just return the poison data. And like, you know, I have had days when I've been tempted to set the flag to true. Um, so you're sort of relying on me sort of not feeling malicious at any given time for your servers to, um, for your data sets to be high quality. Uh, and this is not a world we want to live in. Um, you know, I, I'm good most of the time, but like there are other people out there who, who may not be as, as good as me and like they could do sort of equally uh, similar attacks. Um, and so like this is sort of the world that we're living in. Um, I, I sort of have all these domains, they point to one server and, you know, I returned 404 every time, um, but like, you know, who knows what's going to happen for, for other people in the future. Okay. Um, so, um, this sort of brings the obvious question, you know, what could you do with 0.01% of Lyon? And our paper actually doesn't really touch on this at all because like this is what the existing literature already shows. Like the existing literature has very, very clearly demonstrated that if you could poison data sets, then you could do various harms. Um, so for example, one paper we wrote last year looks specifically at poisoning these kinds of data sets like um, you know, conceptual captions where we showed that a control of a very small amount of the data set, in particular, this one is 0.01%, which you know, is kind of <laughs> nice that these numbers matched up. Uh, that's not a coincidence. Um, show that um, we could sort of cause some backdooring or, or poisoning effects. But you know, at, at that research, when we did it, we were looking mostly at conceptual captions, 3 million. This data has 3 million examples. Um, you might be wondering, does this scale to attacks of, of the size of Lion 400 million? And so we actually simulated this attack um, on the full line 400 million with a big giant clip model. And it, there's two things that we can achieve um, with, if I have some target image in mind that I want to, to poison, with 90% of the time, I can make this image be classified as unsafe for work by the lie on stability, um, sort of unsafe for work classifier. So if I want to, so some person that I don't like and I want sort of all of the models to treat them as some like unsafe content, I can you know, poison their data to make that their data looks like unsafe. Uh, more broadly, if I want to classify something as just like a random image net object, I have a lower percent probability of, of achieving this roughly 60%, but like, you know, I can still do this um, for, for many of these objects. Um, we, we don't focus too much on the potential impact because I think this is where machine learning researchers are, are very good at like sort of driving these numbers up. Uh, we wanted to focus mostly on the like demonstrating the practicality in the first place. Um, but this sort of gives some um, some evidence that that these kinds of attacks are are something we can actually do for for these very big data sets today. Okay. Um, so that was sort of the the setup. Um, this is an attack that we call split view poisoning um, because what it's doing is it's sort of taking advantage of the fact that there's a difference between the data set as seen by the initial curator and the data as seen by the person who downloads the data set finally. Um, and the attack that I've introduced here is one method for achieving split view poisoning. That's the majority of what the paper focuses on for this piece. Um, but you could imagine there are all kinds of other ways you could achieve this same result. You could you know, try and buy domain names off people. You could you know, pay people to host malicious content at these URLs. 
You could try and exploit domain names, so try and exploit servers to host malicious content at these URLs. There are lots of ways you could achieve this ultimate goal. We focused on the method that did not require like any bribery or sort of you know other malicious sort of behavior and just buy, buy bought expired domain names. But um, in general, there are lots of ways you could achieve the same thing. And really what makes the split view poisoning, just to sort of walk through clearly, is it used to be the case that there was like this single data set creation process where some research would sit down, decide I want to collect some data set, go crawl the data, and then publish it to the people on the internet. Um, and now what we do is we sort of split this in half. Is we have, you know, the, the data set is first specified by some people, and then they publish a paper saying, here's the data set, and then people later go and download it. And this split view poisoning really is focusing on the second half of it. And it sort of lets you poison the data set after it's been specified, but before it's been done. Okay. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, buying domain names is just one way to perform this kind of attack, um, but we focus on this one just because it's the easiest. Okay, um, so that's what I'm mostly gonna talk about in terms of the attack. Um, but maybe one interesting thing to comment on is the fact that we have these domain names actually gives us a pretty interesting telescope to, to measure dataset downloads. Um, and so here's a, a plot from the paper where what I'm showing on the x-axis is time and on the y-axis is accesses to my server. So like I have a server running that is hosting a bunch of URLs that are correspond to um, different URLs in this case in the conceptual captions 12 million data set. I put a dot every time someone accesses a given URL. Uh, I've ordered the URLs as they occur in the index and I've color coded them based on the IP of the person who requests. And so we can see that like, you know, there are a lot of people who download these data sets today. Like you, you might be concerned, well, maybe the data set was, was constructed once and then everyone who's ever gonna download it just like downloads it, um, you know, in the first, you know, two days and then they never access it again. But like, you know, it turns out like people just access these data sets all the time. Um, this is just, you know, a, a short a sort of window of time when people are downloading it. Um, and we see already just a bunch of people going through. You might notice it's kind of interesting. There are like some people download it really slow. Some people download it fast. Some people split it into like eight parallel jobs and, you know, pause and resume. But like you can sort of see very clearly there are lots of people downloading the data set here. Um, and if we sort of aggregate a, this sort of across, uh, you know, across a period of six months, um, that we have like a lower bound of like roughly 10 people a month download Lion 400 million and roughly 30 people a month download conceptual captions 12 million and conceptual captions 3 million. Um, this is a strict lower bound because we did a bunch of estimates in order to try and figure out what this number is. But, um, you know, this is sort of gives us a rough order of magnitude of the number of people we could have poisoned with, with these data sets. So we know that there were roughly 800 downloads to data sets that um, we could have poisoned in the, in the time that we owned the domains. Okay. So um, that's the first attack that we introduced in the paper, which show, well, focuses on domain names. Uh, now let me introduce you to a second attack um, that's um, going to be uh, slightly different, but it's going to sort of extend the generality of this first attack. Um, so the way that the this, this split view poisoning works, right, is I, I presented this sim simplified schematic where you have a data set that's first specified and then downloaded, and then we poison the downloaded piece. But this is not like exactly what happens in practice. And if you sort of zoom out into like how things actually go, what happens is that the data set is specified and then it's downloaded sometime potentially very far in the future. And so in order for split view poisoning to work, you have to have sustained control over the resource where the data is hosted. And for domain names, this, this works, right? Like I can host, the data forever and people it will keep on coming to me. But there are lots of other settings where you might imagine this isn't the case. And so let's suppose that we were in some setting that you know I only had control of the data for a small amount of time. Then if I get unlucky and I sort of don't hit the time when the person is downloading the data set, then my attack is doesn't work. It sort of misses the download and the person receives a benign copy of the data set. And so what we wanted to do is to try and extend the generality of split repoisoning into something that we can poison when we don't know, or we don't have sustained control over some resource. Okay, so how might this work? Um, our second attack is called front running poisoning. And what we're gonna try and do is front run the data set collection process. And what I mean by this is we're gonna try and predict when the data set collection is going to happen, and then just like online poison immediately before the data is actually collected so that we only need to poison it for a very small amount of time. Okay, so, so what's the setting where this is actually Practical, uh, 
Oh, okay, I have a picture. Yeah, here, here's the, the process where you, you predict when it's going to happen. Okay. Um, all right, so what's the setting where this um, is actually practical? Well, um, lots of people train machine learning models on Wikipedia. Uh, Wikipedia is sort of the foundation of a bunch of different NLP data sets. And people use it all the time for, for various tasks. And the reason why it's interesting is that anyone can edit Wikipedia. And it's sort of very sort of well known that people occasionally vandalize Wikipedia to just put whatever random content they want. And, you know, it's bad, but it's only time limited in some sense. You know, like the people are going to go and revert the edits usually within a couple minutes. And so you can, you know, you can put some malicious content on Wikipedia. I can try and poison a data set by poisoning Wikipedia, but you know, who knows when the data set's going to be downloaded? Like probably my poisoning is not actually going to make it into the data set because it'll be reverted just a few minutes later. All right, so, so what are we going to do about this? Um, well, this sort of brings the question. First, let's sort of try and figure out how do people actually download Wikipedia for use in machine learning? And you might think naively what they do is they sort of, they crawl the Wikipedia live and they download a copy and then they train on this data set. But that's actually not what happens. And the reason why it's not what happens is because Wikipedia tells you, please don't do this. They say explicitly a paragraph titled, please do not use a web crawler. Um, instead, what they do is they, they provide by themselves a series of these snapshots of the entire Wikipedia database at any point in time. Um, and you can use these snapshots um, to go and download them and train the model on these snapshots, which saves them a lot of bandwidth and you know, makes everything nicer for everyone. And so when people create the sets like the pile or any of the other sort of derived data sets, they, they use these data set downloads. Okay. And the observation that we make is that these snapshots turn temporary vandalism into a permanent part of the record. So like if you were lucky enough to poison the data set right before the snapshot was taken, your vandalism might be reverted just a few minutes later, but like too late, it's already made it into the snapshot. Like you, you have sort of one, you just need to like make sure you can vandalize the page every time the download is taken, roughly once a month, and you will sort of succeed in continuing your poisoning. So like even if I have only a few minutes of control every month over the data set, that is enough to maintain sustained control essentially forever. Okay, so great. Um, but again, this begs the question, how do I time this? Like how do I figure out when exactly Wikipedia is going to download? The data set, like, why should I be able to know, know what this answer? Um, and it turns out the reason why is because Wikipedia is a very open company and they just tell you when the download starts. Like they have a web page that sort of, you sort of this goes to the page and you scroll down a little bit, um, you'll find a, a bulleted list of down to the second, exactly when the download has started for any given snapshot. Um, and they sort of keep this sort of very up to date. And so you can just check exactly when the downloads have started and as soon as the download starts, you can go and start making your poison um, samples, uh, vandalize all the pages, and sort of get the your edits into Wikipedia. Okay, but it's it's, just, it's it's a little bit more complicated than this because it's not actually that like the snapshots are not instantaneous. Like they don't like lock the database and then snapshot and then unlock. That would be be bad. I mean, it takes roughly twenty four hours to snapshot English Wikipedia. You don't want to lock Wikipedia like twice a month for twenty four hours. So what they do is they they do a rolling snapshot. Um, so the question is, you know, how do you know not when the data set download starts in particular, but how do you know when to poison any given article? Because I want to like sort of poison as many of the articles as I can. Um, so, okay, so, so, so here's a plot. Here's a nice plot. On the x-axis, I have the article ID for Wikipedia. Uh, this is like every article has an internal ID. You can just look it up. And on the y-axis, we have time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a dot anytime there was an edit to Wikipedia. Um, okay, first I'm just going to sort of put all the dots on the page and like, there's not much that you can see. Like there's just a bunch of dots on a page and it looks relatively uninformative. But let me just do one thing and I'm just going to color some of these points. I'm going to color the point red if um, the edit was in the April 2022 uh, Wikipedia snapshot. I'm going to color the edit orange if the edit was not in the April 2022 Wikipedia snapshot. So same data as before, I'm just gonna add some saturation. I take this plot, I add saturation and you get this. I guess I did blue, I, I lied. Blue and orange, uh, matte plot colors. Um, so um, here's what happens. You get this very nice sawtooth pattern where what you see is that for the, the edits that occurred 
roughly at you know the time 400,000, more or less they appeared in the data set. But like there's a very clear linear pattern where like there are eight parallel jobs, so sort of snapshotting articles in order. And so there are some edits that occurred earlier than older edits with the earlier edit not included, but the older edits included just because it didn't get to there in time. But what's nice about these is each of these lines is very, very straight. Like if I sort of zoom in a little bit, you can sort of plot the earliest edit that didn't make it into the data set and the oldest edit that did. And then you can fit a line in between these two. And you can very, very clearly predict when the snapshot is actually happening for any page, which means this gives us roughly down to the you know, few minutes, a very accurate estimate of when any individual page on Wikipedia is going to be crawled. And so we can poison the data. So we can sort of modify this page at this exact moment in order to poison the data set. And if you sort of aggregate this all together, it sort of gives us a rough bound of like 5% of English Wikipedia. Like we could sort of poison roughly 5% of English Wikipedia to be, um, articles to have some malicious content. Now, obviously their anti-abuse tools are going to come into play well before this. But the point of this number is to show that like the technical, how do I poison the data set is not the problem anymore. The problem is like standard security anti-abuse. It's not like, well, maybe someone won't be able to poison the data set. Like, no, like they can sort of do a lot of things, but you're relying on the fact that Wikipedia can detect vandalism at scale, which they're pretty good at, but you're, you're now relying on that. You're not relying on the fact that maybe this is not possible. Okay. Uh, and in particular, you can sort of measure this across languages. It turns out that it's easier to poison low resource languages than high resource languages. Uh, in part, this is because the snapshots happen much faster. Uh, and, and also it's because vandalism um, is reverted slower on these other languages. And so we're in this world again, where this, um, you know, the people who have less data are worse off, not only sort of normally, it's also easier to, to poison their data. Okay. <clears throat> so this is um, most of what I wanted to talk about. Uh, let me just end on a, a couple defenses. That, um, that prevent or mitigate most of these attacks. So I'll start with um, sort of split view poisoning. Um, I like the, sort of the fundamental thing that we're exploiting here is this fact that there's a difference between the curator's view of the data and the actual downloaded version of the data. And so preventing this is actually fairly straightforward. All you need to do is verify that the curator's view of the data is the same as the downloaded data. In particular, the curator should produce a cryptographic hash of the data when they download it. The downloader should verify the cryptographic hash matches, and if it doesn't, they should reject the image. Um, you know, so this is this is now done. If you go to Lion, you can now like download Lion that has that cryptographic hashes. Um, the data downloaders people use support you know verification of hashes, and so you can sort of you can do the right thing. Uh, this is good. Um, it sort of is is sort of good that we, that we sort of figured this out, um, but it doesn't come for free. Uh, in particular, let's look at one of the older data sets, conceptual captions 3 million, and I'll report to you three numbers. So first is how big the data set was at release. Uh, conceptual captions 3 million had 3.3 million images. Then I'll tell you how big the data set is today if you just crawl it live. You'll find that 2.9 million of these images still exist. And then you ask, what happens if I check hashes? What if I reject all of the image that, images that have changed from the initial version to the version today? And you'll find that you only get 1.1 million images that are unchanged. So if you were to apply this defense on conceptual captions 3 million, you would pay a penalty of roughly 3x your data set size. So this is, this is good in that defense has fixed the security problem, but are people willing to pay a factor of three in data set size for this data set in order to take this defense? I suspect most people probably aren't, but I, I guess we'll find out. For newer data sets, the number is substantially smaller. For Lion, it's roughly 10%, but we have no reason to believe that as time passes, the fraction of the data set that, that has invalid hashes will just continue to you know, grow as it has here, and, and you'll sort of have a standard usability sort of versus security trade-off where people will maybe be encouraged to disable the flag that does this verification because they want the bigger data set. Okay, so that's that's one way of preventing split view poisoning. Now let me talk briefly about mitigating front running poisoning and defenses that might prevent this. Um, and the first is that um, you, I mean, the basic idea for this defense is you want to just give the defenders more time between when any edits are applied and, and when the content is sort of snapshot forever. In, in particular, there's like two ways you can imagine doing this. You could imagine just randomizing the time at which it was collected 
you know, this makes it harder so people don't, can't predict down to the minute when any given article is going to be snapshot. Or you can try and like backport reversions. So you can imagine like having a trusted set of people who like are the editors and you could, you know, essentially, you know, get cherry pick all of the undo operations and then like backport them to the snapshot um, before you actually produce a snapshot. So you produce a snapshot on day one, wait until day two, look at all of the edits that are reversions between day one and day two, take all of those that are by trusted people, apply those, and then snapshot the data set of the, that's there. So this is this data set never existed. Like, you know, this data was never like, that was never an article as it existed, but like it's a cleaner version of the article than any of the ones that are sort of intermediate. Um, and, you know, we sort of, we talked with the people at, at Wikipedia and we, we sort of let them know about these, these various things and um, yeah, we'll, we'll see sort of what happens there. Um, okay, yeah, so um, brief conclusion then before we, we go to questions. Um, the, basically the title of the talk is the conclusion in some sense. Uh, so these, these poisoning attacks um, are practical, well, practical threats. Um, I think that um, this raises a bunch of interesting questions, both from the machine learning research side, from the security attack side, and from the security defense side. Um, from the machine learning research side, it, it raises new interesting questions because the kinds of attacks that you can do are slightly different than the kinds of attacks we're studying. And so there's some questions about um, you know, trying to make attacks that better match the threat model that we actually have in this paper. From the defense side, there's some good questions on how do you produce low overhead defenses that um, that won't sort of require you in the worst case get rid of 30 or like 70 percent of your data set um like uh, constructing these these poisoning defenses that scale to data sets of billions of images is going to be very hard and and finally just from the the set of trust assumptions i think it's interesting just to consider broadly the fact that in, until now we've like relied on these trusted data sets where we sort of took one party and just sort of told them like you are the, the the trusted party and you are the oracle we will trust you for all of the data you provide to us and this may not be the world we want to live in we may want to have some notions of distributed trust where some people might go and verify a snapshot at some point in time we may not want to sort of trust any one person's version of the snapshots we might want to you know aggregate the trust across many people and i think there's a bunch of interesting questions to be done there and our paper has a little bit of discussion around this and i think this is a, a very nice opportunity for some future work on trying to understand broadly the assumptions that we're putting into these um into these data sets so with that um yeah thank you very much and happy to take uh, any questions you may have Cool. Thank you so much, Nicholas. I'll just uh, briefly stop your screen share so that uh, the, the viewers on YouTube can can see our faces during the Q and A. Um, that that thank you so much for for your talk. That that was really really interesting. I see there's a lot of questions coming in on Discord and a couple on YouTube chat. Um, so just want to remind everyone that you can post questions on Discord or, or the YouTube chat if you have them. Um, I kind of wanted to start off with a, a sort of higher level question. Um, one thing that strikes me about these attacks is that, um, and the, the analogy that you made at the beginning kind of about the system security questions kind of got me thinking down this line, uh, is that the people who are kind of the, the defenders and then the people who are, uh, you know, building these models are seeming like they're, they're not always the same people. So I think Wikipedia is a great example where, you know, the folks who are maintaining and creating Wikipedia, they probably when they started the project however many years ago, they probably didn't think, oh, one day somebody's gonna train a machine learning model so that when we take these, when we take these snapshots, we, we suddenly have to be careful about these things. Um, that seems like a very different relationship than say Intel who are printing chips of their own and kind of um, selling these chips and, and kind of realizing that there's some security uh, thing going on. Yeah, this is so a very good point. Your play? Yeah, no, this is, thanks Leo, this is a very good point. Um, you know, I like w Wikipedia snapshots are exactly what they say they are. Like they're a snapshot of the article at a certain point in time. Like they are doing their job right. It's sort of like as machine learning researchers, we're just asking them to do more. Like, like we, we sort of are, are assuming that what they produced is like this, this pristine sort of trusted version of some article that we can, we can always sort of rely on to be accurate, which Wikipedia never claimed it was. They produced, they claimed it was a snapshot of articles at a certain point in time. And that's honestly what they are. And so like in a very real sense, like this is not Wikipedia's fault. Like this is the machine learning people's fault for taking some data set that wasn't supposed to be a trusted source of, of truth and, and treating it as if it was one. Um, 
And so, yeah, I think it's a good question of, um, it would be sort of, I think, interesting to consider defenses that people who are, I mean, in, in print, like Wikipedia is nice because like all of the data is open. So like in principle, someone could go and create like the cleaned version of this, this data set by taking, you know, various edits and, and doing this sort of randomized sampling or this, this backporting of edits that would be safe for, for training a machine learning model on. I, I think it would be great if someone wanted to go and do that. But yeah, like you're saying, um, the people who host this data sort of are, it's not just the Wikipedia one. Let me sort of go back to the, like the images for domain names, right? Like um, when I host, you know, whatever domain I want, like one of the domains we have is some like flower place in, in India. Like they, they went out of business, I guess, or something. They, they sort of closed their domain. And then like, you know, 30,000 images of flowers went offline. It's like, you know, their business was selling flowers. They decided not to do that online anymore. And, and now like a data set is worse off for it. Like this is not their fault. It's the data set's fault for relying on these people to continue doing this thing um, in like the way that they wanted. And so like, we, we really need to be careful on like, just because some people have the ability to fix it doesn't mean that the people should be the ones who are fixing it. Like we should be very careful with like, who we're sort of placing the blame on here. Right. Um, I think Percy had a question, so I'll sure. turn it over to him. Hello, Nicholas. Um, great talk. <laughs> Thanks. I wanted to ask about um, the existing examples that you had were sort of more trusted sources like Wikipedia and Lyon. And, um, and in those cases, you could sort of put in different measures. But it seems to me that the if you think about looking forward, um, these data sets are going to expand. And fundamentally, these foundation models are based on web crawls where most of the sites are um, uh, uh, not clean. Um, yeah. and, and right now, as we speak, there are probably people putting in malicious content on the web somewhere. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, in, in that, I guess it's a broad question, what, what do you do about this? It seems like maybe you would have to actually live with the fact that whatever data set you have has been poisoned in some way mm -hmm. and you would need some sort of defense strategy that's looking at either the metadata or the content to remove that and not be as effective but it also seems like a very daunting and yeah awesome. you're completely right um i don't think we have a good answer here um in the appendix to our paper we do some analysis of common crawl um where with this common crawl is just like a complete dump of the internet like it's like and yeah this is one area where th there is no trusted source of truth and i think that yeah it's a very challenging question to ask how you can trust the data that was trained on here i don't think that i have any good answers uh, hashes don't work because people's web pages change all the time like for good reason, you know, like I, I want to change my bio or I want to sort of update the list of publications or whatever. Like yeah, you can't sort of require that I don't change my content. Um, I don't have any good answers now. I think that for the immediate future, it does seem kind of like we just have to trust the fact that the attacks are pretty rare, but if people start doing them, then we're going to have to just build models with the knowledge that anyone could be doing this today and hope that we can tolerate it. Um, I think this is, compelling evidence that people should maybe start developing defenses that try and scale to these big giant data sets, but I don't have any ideas there either. I think like it's very murky to know what to do here and I don't have yeah, good thoughts. I mean, maybe just to paint a, a um, more vivid picture. I mean, a lot of these attacks would be presumably driven by some sort of economic incentive to cause harm or do something. So there's some goal. And yeah. I, if you were an attacker, I guess, what would your goal? Yeah, this is, so this is the one saving thing I think right now is that, yeah, um, attacks. So let's look at sort of internet security and in like, you know, late 90s, early 2000, like late 90s, early 2000, like the entire internet was like all broken and anyone could break anything. But like in the late 90s, no one, very, people basically didn't do very much. Like if they vandalized a page, it was like to be like, you know, look how cool I am. I can break into your site. Like, haha, I was here. Um, but like, they're, like they're pretty rare and then like you know early 2000s credit card not, numbers start going online and now all of a sudden there's a reason to exploit other you know computers and you have like a summer where like you know every third day another worm like takes down half the internet um i think 
right now, there are not huge reasons to want to poison these models. And so the reason why people would do it is mostly for like showing off, which I think limits the number of people who would actually do that today. But I think it's sort of, it's hard to know what the potential impact would be without knowing exactly how these models are being used. So, you know, why would I want to poison stable diffusion? I don't know. Maybe there's some economic argument to be made for, I don't want um, people to like, let's imagine artists. You could imagine like, I don't want someone to train a model on, on my art. So I'm going to poison it. So whenever they ask for images of art, like what I was doing, it produces garbage or something. But, um, you know, these sort of use cases are a little bit hard to come by. I'm I'm not sold that there's like the perfect example of this right now, but it's at the same time it's a point to realize. What was it? Oh, just to, just sorry to interrupt. Uh, if people start using the Bing Chat uh, and bar exactly whatever, this kind of yeah, like as like, people use this more, yeah, definitely. And it, it seems like if you, I mean, it's basically an S, SEO seems like, I mean, what's the difference SEO? <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah, so yeah, if, if you could, if there was a way to make money out of SEO from poisoning these models, I, yeah, I, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that people would try this. If like, this is like one of these, these areas where these models are new enough that I don't think that they're being like, put into places that are economically viable like today, but in two or three years, I would be surprised if they weren't. I just don't know yet what the application cases are, but yeah, no, thanks. Yeah, I think this is a, no, a good thing to consider. Was, uh, telling me about his idea that you could do ad placements in Bing Chat GPT by sort of telling it, you know, my favorite drink is Coke, my favorite airline is United. <laughs> um, and you could certainly imagine like astroturfing companies pivoting to data poisoning, large language models, and making it so that your favorite product is X whenever it searches for like oh what's a good i don't know baby crib or something like you could think of the long tail of product placements uh, yeah, yeah, super valuable that, that, that's probably uh yeah that's fun i haven't thought about this uh yeah but no i mean yeah all of these sort of products are like you know weeks old at this point like you know i, I have to imagine there will be many more of them in in, in the coming year or years I want to ask about um, sort of the the other side of sort of the thing you downplayed, which is like the capabilities of like, can we execute the attack part? Because I'm curious about how sort of universal the attacks you're thinking of are. You know, if I just have a magic string that if I put it anywhere on the internet and it gets crawled and scraped, it suddenly like completely breaks the language model. That seems like it's undefendable, right? But I don't think that's the state of data poisoning research. Like if you have data augmentation, if you don't know the target architecture or the optimizer, I don't think your poisons are that strong. So like, where's the state of the art and like, where do you see things going and what's the limit of capabilities <clears throat> here? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so on the language side, I'm not as familiar with the poisoning literature. Um, I don't think, so, okay. So yeah, so um, this sort of a single example of something inserted, I don't think will do very much, but what we have is the ability to poison a pretty large fraction of these data sets. I mean, you know, okay, so maybe a couple a tenths of a percent is not a large fraction, but it's, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, pretty large. This seems to me like it should be big enough. But um, yeah, I, the reason I think I downplayed it is just because this is where a lot of the research is already happening. Mm -hmm. And I want to sort of like, I want to isolate, yeah, the sort of, can it be done with what, what, are the, what are the effects of it can be done? I, I, I know for images that, that what we have is sufficient for text. I think it is, but I'm not sure exactly what the latest research on the poisoning is. But yeah, it's, it's sort of like, okay, so maybe I'll mention like one of the kinds of things that what, there's a difference between what, what we do and what the research does, where uh, in the case of images, what, what we have control over is we can control the image, but not the corresponding caption because of the way that this, these data sets are constructed. But there's no research that looks at what happens if the adversary can control the image, but not the caption. So like there's sort of a couple of these cases where there's a discrepancy between like what we can do and what the research has been studying. And I think part of what I'm hoping for with like this kind of attack and what I hope are follow-up papers that look at kinds of attacks that are like this is to be able to have papers that tell us here are the things that like actually could happen and then people go and do research on what are the effects of this, as opposed to current research papers that, um, you know, write threat models 
that are sort of fairy tale threat models of like, you know, here's the things I would like the worlds to be possible, but may not actually be possible. So, yeah. uh, I want to give the, uh, give the students <laughs> yeah. a, a couple uh, opportunities to ask some of their questions. Um, there, there was an interesting question early on um, about kind of uh, cases where uh, some sort of poisoning may be happening already accidentally. So um, uh, if you've seen this work about kind of uh, the token solid gold magic harp, uh, and yeah. the GPT tokenizer um, as yeah. something kind of. Uh, I'm annoyed. So uh, we so we all, uh, in 2020, I wrote the, I wrote this paper on extracting training data from language models, and I had an appendix that talked about solid gold magic harp, and I cut it. Like before, and then everyone's oh. been very interested in the last two weeks. Like, yeah, okay. So if you don't know, the GPT-2 tokenizer was was constructed by tokenizing the the GPT-2 training data set, and there was a single pastebin page that had a um, snapshot of Twitch plays Pokemon, and there was a person on the snap on that page who posted lots and lots of messages, and their username was solid gold magic harp. And so there's that is now a single token in the GPT-2 vocabulary because this one person in this one document had their name appear several thousand times. There are other ones. There are like there are maybe I think four or five Reddit users who have their own GPT-2 tokens. Like they're sort of that's their claim to fame. Um, and there are other examples of this too, like real Donald Trump is it's it's like a single token, I believe. Um, and then there are some tokens that correspond to this obscure templating engine for product sales that as a result of class names in the HTML that are incorrectly parsed from the GPT-2 um, tokenizer. And yes, yeah, so these are all, all examples we found yeah, a couple of years ago. And so these are not poisoning attacks per se. Um, these are like, you know, um, obscure failure modes of what happens when you scrape the internet for random data and then train on anything you happen to get. And I, I agree, they're, they're very interesting, um, but I don't think that the people sort of were, were trying to poison, but I know I definitely agree that um, if if someone wanted to poison, these this is sort of very strong evidence that um, the ability to control a single web page that goes into the document sort of like would give you very large amounts of power. Like it's sort of, in 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 my ideal world, the tokenizer should not be affected too much based on like any one web web page on the document happened to be. And uh, this is sort of a, a failing of the way that we construct these tokenizers. And you can imagine differentially private versions of tokenizers that would be better in many ways. And this is, it would prevent this kind of this kind of attack. Um, but um, yeah, I, I do think that this is a interesting question, interesting observation that that many of these things exist. Uh, we, we just got another interesting question from the chat and something I was thinking about a little bit as well. Um, the question is, is it inherently bad if an artist wants to protect their art by poisoning the, their data set? For example, let's say I'm an artist. I don't want any of my images to be in stable diffusion to yeah, yeah. five or whatever. Um, no, I mean, I I'm like, I'm not in the business of um, declaring what is good or bad. Like there are sort of philosophers who, who make careers out of that. I am in the business of showing what is possible. Um, and, uh, you know, security is very much a setting where the same technology can be used for good and for bad. Um, you know, you want to have encryption so that everyone can protect their privacy, but it's sort of unfortunate that as a result, you know, terrorists get to encrypt their messages. Um, you know, you might want to have robust machine learning models that can, you know, always be able to detect various forms of cancer, but the same, the same robust machine learning model that like is very, very resilient to distribution shift now might make a very, very good face detection model that is very hard to hide from. Um, you, you might want adversarial examples to hide from face detection models, but you might not want someone with an adversarial example to be able to fool your spam detection model. Like, you know, all of these things, like there's no like good or bad side of it. I think the important thing to do, okay, I don't wanna say there's never a good and bad side, but like in most of these general technologies have positive and negative applications of them. And um, I try as much as possible to focus on demonstrating what can be done and try not to do anything that is obviously only bad. And then, uh, 
like go from there and let other people who are better qualified to evaluate what's good in some sense uh, tell me that because I don't feel particularly trained to answer those kinds of questions. Yeah. So one thing that this discussion reminds me of, um, and I think I've, I've heard some people discussing it uh, in the, the past few weeks or months, uh, has been as we start uh, releasing these language models into the wild, like the, the, the new Bing and ChatGPT and things like that, um, if we want to continually retrain this, now there, there are going to be outputs on the internet that kind of uh, are affected by, by the models themselves. And I think sometimes I see tweets that are just like, I love Sydney uh, 20 times in a row so that you know whoever the person is will, will be liked by, by the next version of, of Bing or ChatGPT. Um, do you have any thoughts on how we uh, want to sort of mitigate this or uh, take this into account as we start thinking about training uh, models and, and thinking about kind of the, this interplay. Um, yeah. Releasing the wild. Uh, yeah, this is also another good question. Um, so, okay, so I think there's two different answers. One answer if you care only about utility and one answer if you care about utility and security. If you care only about utility, it's not obvious to me that we need to do anything. Like these models are very robust to noise. Like there are, there is, you, these models are already trained on worse content, like noisier content than the output of a previous language model. Like if the output of the previous language model was like, you know, 90% of the internet, maybe I should be worried. But like, if it's like a small fraction of it, like, like I spent some time studying like what goes into the pile and like there are just like entire just like megabytes of web pages that just like it's just random just entirely random content like just like random words strung together that have no meaning whatsoever and we feed this into the model and it still does fine um and so if, if you care about utility it's not obvious to me that you need to care you may be able to do better by removing this garbage and training on on higher quality data i suspect this is probably true but um at least for now, we've okay. If you care about security, obviously, then this is worrying. Um, but again, you know, going back to the earlier questions, I, I don't know what to do about this. Like, um, given the scaling laws we see, even even the chinchilla scaling laws, we're going to need more data. Like, data is like the limiting factor in in many of the scaling things we want to be able to do, and so it has to come from somewhere. We've exhausted the trustworthy data sources for the most part. Like the only option is to go for the less trustworthy data sources. Um, I don't know how you handle the fact that you need more data with the fact that you need to trust the data. Like this, this seems very hard and I hope this is a question that people will start to think about quite a lot. Right, yeah, definitely a very interesting set of questions. Uh, we have one uh, question from the YouTube chat that, that I wanted to get your opinion on. Um, and that is, is there a risk in researching feasibility of these attacks? Um, like, would there be more potential attackers opening up more security holes? How do you kind of mitigate that uh, risk during the research process? Yeah, okay, this is a good question. So in general, with uh, very few exceptions, security researchers have agreed for like the last 10 years that the right thing to do for security research is to try and understand what the potential attacks are, then take steps to make sure that the paper or whatever your disclosure is, is not going to cause immediate harm and then talk about the results. Okay, why? Um, so um, why is this? Because I mean, this has been generally known as a responsible disclosure. And the reason why people do this is that this observation that you can buy domain names is not, deep like this is not some like you know fundamental like i needed to have a phd and been working in machine learning research for five years to like be able to like this is like everyone knows this and so if we don't write this paper now i'm sure someone will come up with the same idea like it's really easy to have this idea and they might not be as nice and they may not publish the paper and then you have this world where people are actively exploiting it for some time before we actually realize this is a problem. And by us writing the paper and then like informing all of the data set authors and having them release data sets with hashes and patch the downloader tool and then putting the paper online, we at least make sure that for this vulnerability, we don't make things worse. Like now the world knows another practical attack, this is true, but the world was already gonna know about this attack in some amount of time. Like this is sort of like, this is not a, a hard thing to do. And this is sort of a, a yeah, debate people have had in security for a very long time. And this is the sort of 
what people have settled on as the right way of doing things. And this has been applied to settings that are with much more real world consequences than, than this paper. Um, and so like, this is, I guess, why I feel comfortable spending most of my time doing attack research is like, I don't believe that the skills that I have are unique in the world. Like if, if I believed that like I could, I could come up with an attack that no one else would ever discover, then maybe it would be wrong for me to publish it. But like, I'm not that special. Like there are other people who could do the same things and they may not be as nice as to publish it. And so we should sort of do the work before it sort of could have, cause significant harm, tell people how to prevent the problem, have people start working on defenses before it's the case that like it would be economically viable to exploit these kinds of things. Right. Thanks for that that great answer and kind of that, that overview of the philosophy of security research. Um, we're approaching 4.30, so I just want to uh, give you one more chance to, to kind of say uh, if there's anything, you know, really exciting that you're looking forward to, any upcoming research that we should um, be paying attention to, or, you know, any any, any sort of call to action that, that you want to give the audience. No, um, no, yeah, thanks for giving me the time to, to come talk here. Um, I think, you know, if I was to end on anything, it would be to say that, you um, We've been doing research for a long time in computer security and machine learning, trying to, to understand what these problems are. And I think that we're starting to see applications of these, these models in practice. And I'm really excited by research that tries to understand which attacks can actually be done today. Like this is, I think we've spent a long time trying to do research on like potential attackers that may exist in some hypothetical future. And I think as the research community, occasionally it's our job to go back and sort of have a reality check with the real world. And people are now using a bunch of these models. I think that, you know, the rate of adoption of these models is going to grow pretty significantly over the next couple of years. And, and as this happens, I think we should check back in and make sure that the research we're doing, I mean, it's, it's fine to do basic research. Like, I think like this is important to do, but it's also, you know, every once in a while sort of see if you should adjust your research a little bit to make it something that would, that, that seems more practical and I've been trying to do a little bit of that. Um, we have some very solid understanding of, of the theory of these attacks. And, and now I think it's a good time to try and look at the practical side of them. And so, yeah, this is, I guess, you know, it, this, the, 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 the balance may shift if we sort of figure out lots of practical attacks very quickly. It may, may be time to go back to theory, but I think right now we're sort of, we're, we're short on the, the practical attack side. And I hope that we can, I can maybe use this as an inspiration for encouraging more people to look at more um, practical attacks. But yeah, thank you again. Thank you so much. Um, so that will we'll call it for today. Uh, thank you everyone for listening in online. And thank you, of course, everyone in the class for, for asking uh, some, some really great and insightful questions. Um, next week, we have Jack Ray from OpenAI on Monday. He's very excited to talk about compression for AGI. Got Susan Jong from Meta on Wednesday, and she's going to be talking to us a little bit about the experience training OPT and scaling those models up. So, so we're very excited for those. Uh, if you're interested in kind of seeing our whole schedule, you can go to mlsys.stanford.edu and check us out there. Um, we have a mailing list where we mail out the schedule every week uh, and very little, little else. So, so we promise no spam. Um, and with that, we will uh, wave goodbye to YouTube. Thank you again for coming on, Nicholas.